Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the stream, whether you're joining me live on Twitch or maybe you're watching this after the fact on YouTube. Either way, it is an honor to have you. And this this stream is going to be exciting. So what I want to do real quick is share my screen. And I just want to show you guys on Twitch another place you can join me on Discord, which is the Work Smarter Discord. And the cool thing about this is, as you can see, we got one, two, three, four people in here. And so if you hear people talking uh, throughout that's on purpose. You're not hearing ghosts or other people on here. When people on discord talk, you guys on Twitch are able to hear them. You on YouTube are able to hear them. And we are joined by the great, I think it's Amoeba man. Am I saying it right now? Yes, Amoeba you are. man. You are. Okay, it's, sweet. It's and from I'm a Garfield cartoon in, in the past <laughs> and everything where he was that. And I've, I've just never changed my name ever. That is awesome. My kids love Garfield. But uh, Amoeba Man is the creator of the Enumerating AD Networks, Breaching AD Networks. I didn't realize you created the CVE Network as well in the recent threat one with the AD um, certificate exploit type stuff. So I went through that and I was looking at the rooms you created and realized you created that one. And you created a few more, but we are going to go through something I have never done before. And we're doing the Hacking Hadoop Room. Don't even know if I'm saying that right, to be honest. But I posted a link for those of you on Discord. If you look at the chat, you can grab that link and you can follow along. I'm gonna post it on Twitch as well for the couple of you on Twitch right now. So I would encourage you, click that link. It's a free room on Try Hack Me, so you do not need a subscription. And uh, when we get stuck, we have Amoeba Man to to walk us through this. And this is, I glanced at this earlier today, but I, I just now clicked join the room. So this is completely fresh to me. We're gonna get live troubleshooting and we will we will see how we do. I'm just gonna get Twitch pulled up on the side here, get all my screens set up. Okay, and got Discord right here. Cool, and for those of you on Discord, truly feel free to interrupt anytime, talk anytime. I do not mind at all, we will learn this together so hacking hadoop hopefully you got the time the only thing i've done is join room now is there a machine to start there is i'm gonna i always just try to start the machine when i jump into a room because sometimes it takes just a little bit to start so on task two there's a machine go ahead and jump to task two hit start machine just so it can start while we go through task one it so it does take around six or seven minutes to start so it's good to start it now um, there's there's a little check you'll see at the end of task one that you just need to perform to see that the, the network is live. Um, Hadoop does not like to be virtualized, especially with Docker containers, so it does take quite a bit of time just for the network to, to quickly go up. Okay. Good to know. Well, hey, Walt, before I even jump into task one, do you mind just filling us in a little bit on the background? Like, how did you come up with this room? What's kind of the background of this room? Since it's definitely unique in the different Try Hack Me rooms I've done. I've never seen anything quite like this one. So how did you come up with it? So this room here was based on a um, security assessment that we did um, a while ago. So basically, we just had one of our clients that asked us to test their um, data lake. And we unfortunately sort of like didn't have any anyone that have any expertise in how to test those different things. Um, and we, we ended up sort of just doing research on the job on, on how data lakes work and everything like that. Um, so Hadoop um, is just basically a, a data lake technology, which is used for, for two primary reasons. The first one is that you have distributed um, computing, and the other one is distributed storage. So usually how Hadoop networks work is basically you can think of it as a bunch of different hosts which are joined together. Um, and then essentially you have this control system that's able to take any of the tasks that you want to do and it can then basically break those tasks or reduce those tasks down into a simpler set of instructions. And then you have sort of that control system that then tries to um, basically distribute that load over all of the hosts that you have in the network to make sure that it, that it runs um, fast. But as you can imagine, if we have a control thing and we have something that's distributing work to a lot of different computers, um, that's literally remote code execution as a feature. So yeah. um, there's some interesting attacks that can happen there. Huh, fascinating. Well, I'm looking forward to it. This will be fun. 
Well, let's go ahead. I'm, I'm assuming we need to download these task files too. So before we even jump into things, if you guys want to open up your VM and you can download those task files, you know, I, I thought I set up a shared folder between my host machine and my VM, but my shared folder is always broken. So I'm just going to jump over here to try hack me on my VM and let's download these task files. We'll just do all this to give the machine time. Oh, apparently I have to log in again. Okay. I'm not a robot. I promise. Okay. That's cool. Let's try that again. And download task files again. There we go. And I am going to go ahead and open up my terminal and make a folder for this room to keep things organized. I'll make directory and call it uh, Hadoop. Oh. And I'm gonna move home Cali downloads. Let's see where those files are at. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a VPN connection, I see. Maybe just a note on that one. Um, the reason it's a VPN connection is this is before I joined um, TryHackMe part-time. Um, oh, sure. So you can only create a single virtual machine and Hadoop um, is a network. So basically what I had to do was create a Docker network running on the virtual machine and then essentially run my own VPN server on that machine as well, which then allows you to connect in and then the Docker network becomes your network like you have networks when you, you were doing sort of like breaching 80 or enumerating 80. So it's a, yeah. it's a very janky way to get it to work, <laughs> but it does work. So um, That is yeah. awesome. That's good. That's good problem solving. Like <laughs> just create your own network in that way. So I assume we must connect to both VPNs and we connect to the try hack me VPN and the Hadoop VPN. And I'm sure it probably tells us that I'll, I should just jump into the task. Yeah. No, that's correct. You'll, you'll see that you just have to add like a entry to your hosts file and then you can um, join the VPN. Okay, cool. Well, let's uh, dive into it. I'm just going to check discord real quick. No messages on here. All right, sweet. So for the, the rest of you, hopefully on Twitch and on Discord, you're following along. Let's dive into task one as our machine continues to boot up. And maybe once we get there, it'll be fully booted. So I'm just going to read through it and we'll learn this together. This lab simulates a network through the use of Docker. To access this network, you will first have to configure your routing to enable you to see the network. The lab lives in this network range. You will have to configure this route to the Hadoop network. Since THM does not currently support hosting full networks, we are cheating a bit by hosting a full network using Docker and then using another VPN file to connect into that hosted network. That is awesome. Before starting the lab, please download the second VPN file, which we did. You will start this VPN once your machine is active. Note that if you are using your own machine for hacking, you will have to first start the normal THM VPN, and then in another window, start the second VPN, download the second VPN file, and follow the steps in the next, next task. Let's go ahead and just get that done. So the command, if you guys are new at all to uh, open VPN, it's really easy. It's just open VPN, and then you specify your VPN file. And I just hit the tab button to autocomplete, so we'll do that. And I'm just going to call this Hadoop VPN. Oh, I bet it's not going to, I'd probably need to connect to the Try Hack Me network first. Let's do that. Let's go here. I'm just going to reconnect to this now that I'm on the Try Hack Me. VPN. Don't know if it makes a difference, but all right. Okay. And I'm just going to make these side by side because that's where we're getting into some configuration one of the big benefits of doing this offline is when i can actually have two screens but <laughs> i'll give myself two screens with my one monitor here all right you will need to wait 10 minutes after the lab has started for the cluster to become fully active 
and you can confirm that the lab is ready by running the scan of your choice to confirm that port 8080 is open on there. The network structure as follows. So this must be what we are adding to our Etsy host file. Am I correct on that? These specific three IPs. So all you're, all you're actually adding is the um, DNS name for the VPN. Um, so I had to find a creative way because, of course, everyone's IP address is different. So I couldn't hard code that into the VPN file. So the next sure. best thing was to create a DNS entry um, in the VPN file and then have them um, do it in ETC hosts. And then um, the rest of the resolution should work. So I think it's a task two where it shows you sort of just what entry to add to, oh, your, okay, gotcha. um, to your thing. Okay, I'm just going to head on myself. But we can... We should still be able to test it then um, if we, by running the scan of your choice to confirm that port 8080 is open. Got a phone call. Who's calling me at 10.13 at night? Y'all need to leave Just me alone. run that Nmap scan after joining the second VPN. Um, I think I should have put that part in, in the second task. So just maybe skip quickly to task two. Um, get your second VPN running and then you can perform an nmap scan because of course you're not yet connected to that docker network Sure, okay. I have them both running here, but we'll uh Yeah, let's just go to task two then we'll jump back to that Good to know. All right. Welcome to the Hadoop network start by loading this lab We started that once your lab has started before you can use the VPN from the previous task You will have to add the machines as a static host. This can be done using the following command. So as you guys can see, you have to use sudo if you are not already root. And so we're going to echo this IP and this into our Etsy host file. So we could also just gedit Etsy host as long as you're logged in as root and we should be able to add this. So we'll do 10.10.20.237, hit the tab button to jump over there and thm hadoop network.net. You can also copy and paste this, but I like to always just type it out to help myself learn, make it a little more, little more manual. So let's go ahead and save that. We'll clear. Once this is done and you have given the lab some time to boot, you can start your Hadoop network VPN using the following command, which I maybe started mine a little bit early. Let's just redo it. Oops, we already have VPN too. person left a voicemail too i tell you what probably a spam spam call um verify that your lab is up and running by trying to ping that ip okay let's go ahead and give that a shot 172.23.0.3 hey so far so good unless in map port 8080 on this same host i assume Yep, there it is. So it looks like ours is up and running. We have that web server on port 8080. In this challenge, you will be guided to compromise a data lake. Sounds fun. Most large organizations, organizations out there have at least one data lake, some even more, and the most widely used data lake technology out there is Hadoop. This task will give you a brief overview of Hadoop before you jump into your hacking activities. Hadoop terminology. There are some key terms used in Hadoop that you should know to make this hacking journey easier. It should be noted that Hadoop still makes use of the terms master and slave since primary and secondary already have specific meanings in the context of Hadoop. And actually, I'm going to pause real quick. I meant to start my little timer over here. We'll work in 25 minute intervals and take five minute breaks. And I just started that now. Let's go ahead and jump back into this. It should be noted that Hadoop still makes use of the terms master and slave since primary and secondary already have specific meanings in the context of Hadoop. So cluster refers to all the systems that together make the data lake. A node is a single host or computer in the Hadoop cluster. A name node is a node that is responsible for keeping the directory tree of the Hadoop file system. A data node is a slave node that stores files according to the instructions of a name node. A primary name node the current active node responsible for keeping the directory structure, okay. Secondary name node, the backup node, which will perform a seamless takeover of the directory structure should the primary name node become unresponsive. There can be more than one secondary name node in a cluster, but only one primary active at any given time. A master node, 
Any node that is executing a Hadoop management application, such as HDFS Manager, which I believe is what Amoeba Man was referring to with the RCE kind of built in, or Yarn Resource Manager. Slave node, any node that runs a Hadoop worker application, such as HDFS or MapReduce. It should be noted that a single node can be both a master and slave node at the same time. An edge node, any node that is hosting a Hadoop user application, such as Zeppelin or Hue. These are applications that users can use to perform processing on the data stored in the data lake. Kerberized, the term given for a data lake that has security enabled through Kerberos. Okay. What is Hadoop? Good question. Hadoop is a data-like technology developed by Apache. It is a collection of open source applications and services that can utilize a network of computers, right, the nodes, to solve large and complex problems. Hadoop, in its simplest form, has two main functions, namely distributed storage and distributed processing. In essence, it allows a network of computers to become one very large computer with a massive hard drive and a ton of CPU power, essentially a botnet, right? How big are we talking? Well, let's just put it this way. Most organizations have clusters of about 200 nodes each with about 25 terabytes of storage, equaling a staggering five petabytes of storage and roughly 1700 CPUs, a little more powerful than my laptop. To ensure network speed is not a bottleneck, usually these nodes are connected to each other through multiple fiber lines. The world's largest cluster, 2,000 nodes with 21 uh, petabytes of storage capacity and 22,000 CPUs. That is insane. What are the services of Hadoop? The diagram below shows an example of a Hadoop ecosystem. Note there are many more services than can be integrated. Okay, here's what I want to do. Um, Amoeba Man, if you're comfortable, do you mind just giving us, like walking us through this right here like make make sense of this for us if you don't mind sure um so that top one they called apache ambari so that is basically the application that you use to deploy your hadoop network so we call them your data lake management applications and the two biggest ones you get out there in the world is either apache ambari which is and well all of this is open source it's just that a lot of companies actually build um, on top of these applications so apache ambari is a completely open source one and then the other one is cloudera um, Hortonworks were another one, but um, they and Cloudera have actually merged in, in recent years. So that's the thing where you install this application and that then helps you to deploy your data lake across a, a bunch of different hosts. But as you can imagine, um, out of the box, it's not really fully hardened or secure. So, I mean, you can give Apache Ambari, for instance, a root SSH key, and it will then just use that SSH key to essentially connect to all of the hosts, um, which means that you have a, a shared root SSH key across your entire network. So sure. those type of things. Then the two main sort of applications that it will boot is your HDFS, which is your Hadoop distributed file system. So essentially you can think of this as um, RAID on steroids, um, where basically what's happening is it's distributing the files that you're trying to save across multiple different um, hosts. Um, so you have parity built in. So for instance, if one of your Hadoop nodes goes down, um, it's, it's simple. You don't lose any of your files because there's automatic parity built into that as well. Um, but then, of course, one very important thing to note there is that your normal operating system file system is different from your Hadoop distributed file system. You need an application, HDFS, DFS, to essentially access that um, distributed file system. And the other application that it boots is Hadoop MapReduce, which essentially is your remote code execution as a feature mm. type of thing where you can write map reduce jobs that will get executed on the data lake and can use any of that information in the HDFS. And then there's another one called Apache HBase. So you have HDFS for unstructured data such as files and everything like that. It also boots um, what's called HBase if you choose it, which is just a database that you have. So for structured data, and what's quite cool about HBase is you can even do access control 
to a cell level. So not even a table or a row, but to a cell level, you can grant someone access to only a specific cell in a table, which um, I find quite cool. So that's basically your, your main connection there. And then you have your, your distributed programming things. So pig is a scripting language that you can use. Hive is sort of like SQL query for, for HBase. And then Spark is for, for running a couple of applications. So you have those. Then sort of how we do scheduling is through Uzi, which is a workflow thing. Um, in our case, we're just directly going to connect to, to another application that I'll mention. And then Zookeeper, um, as you can hear, there's a lot of farm animals here. It's essentially the thing that keeps all of them in, in check and make sure that, that all of the, the applications are, are actually working. Um, so, so those are sort of the main things out of this um, diagram. There are a couple of other things like data ingestion. So how do you actually get data? into your data lake and get it out again and then there's some some nice machine learning stuff the one application that's not mentioned here is called yarn which is essentially your resource manager so yarn is the big boss that decides sort of like where jobs are going to go and and everything like that but I mean you can't really show it on on this diagram that's sure. like a very very quick overview of, of Hadoop like I mentioned there's a bunch of other applications and most of them are open source so on this assessment, what was really nice and the way that we sort of learned how to do these type of things is we would find an application, we would literally download the source car uh, files, um, look sure. for like the default configurations and everything like that. And you'll see in this, um, in this network as well, that's sort of the gist of what you are trying to do. Download the things, read through it, and see what the default configuration is and, and see if they changed it. And if they haven't, chances are it's still vulnerable. Man. That is awesome. Thank you for explaining all that. That was way more helpful than if I just like <laughs> said what each one of these was. This is cool stuff. Oh, it explains it a little bit here. We'll, uh, I think we'll be able to skip most of this because we just got the explanation, uh, a really good explanation of it. And you said there's many more yeah. to discover. All these applications just are open maybe source. Yeah. On that note, I just want to talk about two of them that are there. So you get Please. Kafka, which is your message broker. Um, so basically, you know, as you have like HTTP requests, um, that's significantly slower. So we use what's called Kafka, which is essentially like a messaging system. So you have a bunch of topics and then what can happen is you can host a topic and then you have publishers and subscribers to that topic. So it's just a way in how sort of like data flows a little bit faster than something like HTTP. And then the sure. only other one that I think that's worthwhile to, to mention there is Zeppelin, um, because we will be using it in this lab. So Zeppelin is basically a web-based notebook application. You can think of it like a Jupyter um, notebook application. And as you know, Jupyter is running a lot of programming and all of that. And programming has some code execution as well, which is why if you see Zeppelin, it's quite a, quite a great way to get an entry point into the Hadoop network. Good stuff. All right, is security even a thing in Hadoop? Short answer for a really scary long time, no. <laughs> but over the years, improvements have been made. The two biggest improvements were the introduction of authentication through Ker Kerberos and PAM, privilege access management through optional applications such as Ranger. Optional is the scary word here. A lot of data lakes out there simply don't make use of these security controls. In this lab, we will be looking at a Kerberized data lake, so there is some security, but common misconfigurations have led to this data lake being insecure. Note, we will provide assistance on the Hadoop specific components, but basic enumeration, exploitation, and privilege escalation techniques will be expected for you to complete this lab. Awesome. Which node is responsible for actively keeping the directory tree structure of the data lake? That's like the zoo, is it zoo keeper? Which node? Let me, let me go glance at our stuff right up here. Not Zookeeper. It would be the name node or the primary name node, maybe. Hey, what type of node provides applications for users? That would be um, Hadoop, blah, 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 that runs a worker. Uh, here, Edge node that's hosting the Hadoop user application. What Hadoop service is responsible for scheduling jobs? What Hadoop service 
So that's gonna be this Uzi workflow, maybe. It's just called Uzi. Nope, let's try again. Service is responsible. No single node. When in doubt, control F. You Yarn. can check the yes. You can check the the um, applications there. Um, the answer should be should be those ones now. Sure. Okay. Gotcha. What to do? Service provides granular access control to resources. Primary storage, unstructured, vast amounts of data. I remember you talking about this. Privilege access at Ranger. What is the term provided to data lake that makes use of Kerberos for security? Um, ker Kerberized? Who owns the largest Akub cluster in the world? I bet we have to Google that. Looks like other people have Googled it, probably working on this room. Facebook! I gotta collect all of our data, right? So they gotta have a bunch of computers to store that data on so then they can sell it. All right, all about Hindenburg. Let's start the fun. Before we can begin the attack, we have to do some recon. Sounds good. Um, using your favorite network scanner and associated flags, enumerate the services exposed by there. Okay. There are gonna be a bunch of different services and ports exposed. However, reviewing some of them, you'll quickly realize that this Hadoop environment is Kerberized, meaning the only way in is through a legitimate service. Using a breadth first approach, try to enumerate these services and find the edge node applications that are available. One of these will be your primary target. When you finally authenticate, do not rush to RCE. You will shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> Good. Take time to first read through the provided loot and maybe save a copy of it. Okay. Well, we can do nmap, uh, so dash p dash is going to scan all the available ports and it says a breath first approach. So that's probably what we need to do is scan all available ports. And at first I don't try to throw any scripts at it. I just want to see the basic enumeration for saving time and then we will attack those specific ports. So we'll do 23.0.3 dash v for verbose just so we can see that it's working. And Let's give it a shot. Port 8080, I mean, that was that web server, which, you know, while this does its thing, we could just connect to that if it works. So if we do uh, 172.23.0.3 port 8080. And that's Zeppelin. So with that in mind, let's glance back up at what Zeppelin exactly is the chart up here and it might be on the applications down here well oh this is the web-based notebook that was referred to zeppelin is a web-based notebook that enables interactive data analytics you can make beautiful data-driven interactive collaborative documents with sql code and even more we have some documentation there and knowing that it's open source that might be helpful we have a login page here and so we can maybe look through the documentation, maybe the source, maybe there's a default username or password that's still set. Maybe we could do some type of word list there. I'm not sure. These are just, this bring us to Apache type stuff. You know, we could always look at the page source. I doubt there's anything hidden here, but it's always a good practice to glance at the source. Add root only if it's not dev mode. If number, look, if the port does not equal 9,000 config root, I don't think that means anything for us, but maybe it does. We'll come back to it. Uh, let's glance at our scan. Okay, scanning that four ports. My scan looks like it's, <laughs> it might take a while. I might have to change the way I'm scanning. And we could, we could cheat. If I, do I need to scan all ports or if I scan the most common ports, am I okay? So sadly in Hadoop, if you scan the most common ports, you're going to miss most of the Hadoop ports because okay. they're like in the 10,000 range and all of that. But you can leave the scan to run and focus on the web app in, in 80, the 80. meantime. And then we'll get, yes, we'll get back to those, those ports at a, at a later stage. Okay, good. Good to know. 
I'm just going to go back to where we're at. There's going to be a bunch of different services and ports. Reviewing some of them, you'll quickly realize that Hadoop environment is Kerberized. I mean, the only way through is through the service, blah, blah. When you finally authenticate, do not rush to RCE. So what edge node serve is running on this host? I bet that's what this is, possibly. Yeah, I wonder what the hint was. What application is on port eight? Okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a good hint. What file is responsible for the authentication configuration for this service? Well, it is always good to read documentation, especially knowing that it's open source. I, I can never scroll very good in here. So let's just glance through here and see what we all have access to. So we have this dynamic form. We have a display system. We have interpreter. Other features. REST API, it walks through setup. And so what file is responsible for authentication configuration? Well, let's glance here. Maybe we also have Nginx, which let's just look through both of these. It should be basic authentication using Nginx. Nginx is a web server. You can get Nginx on your server. Sites available, touch, off setting, optional. To this form to enable configuration when Nginx loads, set up user credential in the HD password file and restart. We're looking for nginx dot, it might not be Nginx, but it could be. Another option is to have an authentication server that can verify user credentials in LDAP server. Okay, we have the Shiro as well, which is the other thing I opened. Let's just get a quick glance at this. Apache Shiro is a powerful and easy to use Java security framework that performs authentication, authorization, cryptography, and session management. So, explain step by step how it works. This might be what we're looking for. Hey, so let's let's glance through this. Let's see what the hint was. Since Apache Zeppelin is open source, Google Apache Zeppelin authentication. This will point you in the right direction. We looked at the documentation straight from port 8080. So by default in conf, you will find shadow.any template. This file is used as an example and is strongly recommended to create a shadow.any file by doing the following command line. Secure the WebSocket channel. If you don't have this file yet, Okay, starting Zeppelin log in. You can finally log in using one of the below username password combinations. <laughs> so it gives you the username and password combinations. Well, <laughs> let's try them. So we have admin and password one. We'll try that first. Admin, password one. Okay, admin, admin. Okay, one of these will work, I'm sure. Admin, password one, admin, admin, user one, Password two, very secure. Whoops, I don't know what I did there. User one, password two. Look at that. So let's go ahead and just document this. I'm gonna pull up OneNote real quick. You can use whatever your favorite documentation platform is. I'm gonna pull mine over here. You'll see, um, always take good notes. I mean, every class I take, everything I go through, I try to document it down so I can refer back to this and I have my little boxes here. So we'll create a new one. We'll call it Hadoop. And what what we wanna grab, usually I have two screens, so this will make it a little more interesting to do it this way, but let's go here. Um, what I wanna grab is, let's just grab this information right there. Pull it over here. And then our credentials were, was it user one and password two maybe? I'll double check that we have the right credentials there. Look at our user one, password two, the U is a lowercase, but Microsoft is stupid and they want to autocorrect my stuff. Don't autocorrect me. User one, password two, will successful login. So let's just go ahead and document that. We'll also document it's a Zeppelin. I don't know if I spelled that right, but good enough, we'll be able to look it up. And we have the shiro.any service, which is probably something we want to also just keep in mind. 
we'll just honestly just copy our answer there and throw it in our notebook as well so we have it okay yep light shot i know i did that what is the username and password combination that gives you your initial entry that's user one and password two once authenticated submit the flag that is hiding nicely in one of the notebooks okay let's go ahead and do that is it maybe test node hey there's our flag so am i blind just control c let's just kind of look at this so this is python obviously we're importing the os library oh this is that that configuration shiro.ini file that we have here list of users with their passwords allowed to something come on scroll oh look at this so list of users with their passwords allowed to access zeppelin to use a different strategy check the shiro doc to enable admin user uncomment the following line and set an appropriate password so we know that the admin user is not enabled but we have user one password two roll one roll two user two we have another password it may be helpful to grab some of this stuff i think since this is in config file all these accounts would probably be valid so let's just grab this information right here so we have it for future use Okay, I'm gonna glance through here a little more. Sometimes there's other helpful stuff. More details here. And we can see all these things are commented out. So this is just a sample for configuring AD Realm, LDAP configuration. If you were actually configuring this, obviously you'd comment, you would you'd, um, have the lines that you need to use, but they're commented out because we're not actually using most of this. We have the login URL. That that might might be useful i don't know if it's going to be useful or not but we'll grab it just in the chance that it is we'll just grab that information grab it down there urls this is for urls okay to allow anonymous access to all but the stated urls uncomment the line second last line Un uncomment the line second last line that anon and comment the last line authentication comment okay so it's not <laughs> this is confusing it uncomment the line se comment the line second last line and comment the last line okay well they didn't do that so anonymous access is not allowed those links might come up later though so let's go ahead and grab those as well go back to hadoop okay we made it through the end of that little notebook and let's let's keep reading because i said don't jump to rce right away so we won't jump to rce right away i'm gonna check discord cool those of you on discord if you're following along if you guys run into any issues you're probably working ahead of me i'm guessing because you're not reading everything as slowly as i am but if you do run into issues uh, feel free to turn on your, your voice and, and shout it out and we can tackle it together. So rocking it like lead or LED or something. So you found a nice service. Well, not all roles are created equal. This is the first misconfiguration you will see in many data lakes that have the initial security applied. Due to the sheer amount of applications and services running in a data lake, you are bound to find at least one service that still makes use of default creds and configuration. After exploring the loot here, Let's see what we can do to gain access. Oh, it is time to take a short break, y'all. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll dive back into it. For those of you on Discord, if you want to talk amongst yourselves, you can. Just know that your audio will go out to Twitch. I'm going to turn on the break and I'm going to step away from my desk and we will be back in exactly five minutes. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Is anyone working ahead or is everyone just about on pace? If anyone is following along. I'm just following along. I've 
done this one a couple of times now, so <laughs> I'm not going to do it again tonight. <laughs> I'm just listening into it. I'm not really uh, pl uh, following along. Not this time. Next time I will for sure. I will say the scan took uh, just finished. And I started it. Like the very, I don't even know how long ago it was, honestly. But it did take a, a minute there. Yeah, so usually what, what I did on, uh, well, so, sort of for these Hadoop networks is first just dash P dash. Um, and do that with like max retries set to, to like one um, and do a quick scan just to find a port and then ingest those port numbers for the service enumeration scan um, to make it go faster. But on a normal assessment, that's actually not really a, a issue um, because those hosts have um, fiber lines connecting them. I mean, on the assessment that we that we did there, we were talking about four 40 gig per second lines that were basically running from each of the hosts. You could run a dash p dash scan and it would end in like literally seconds. Um, so it's quite nice when you when you're doing this on a actual data lake that has the resources, it goes quite fast. Cool. Amoeba, how did you come up with the idea of this box? Was it uh, you discovered the vulnerability first or was there some other way that that you came up with it? So um, basically it was a assessment. One of our clients asked us to, to test their Hadoop data lake um, and we had no clue how to test um, Hadoop or, or what it even was. Um, I mean, we had a little bit of, of sort of people that, that experienced it in the, in the past. Um, but um, yeah, it was basically just us doing research on the job, figuring out how things work, figuring out sort of like what the misconfigurations was. Um, and this specific network is about um, a boot to root path that I found um, on that assessment and literally the only difference between um, the actual assessment boot to root path and um, this one here is that on mine the zeppelin users um, the zeppelin users the admin user was actually enabled um, so i didn't have to to do some lateral movement there um, i could just use the admin user but everything else is almost to the T exactly the same as what it was on on the assessment. And then after that, I did a bit of research in, in sort of like a dupe and uh, spun up my, my own network of it. Um, I got a couple of things that I sent to, to Apache for, I think it was for Atlas. And the other one was for Ambari, where I found a couple of, of CVEs there that they had to fix with some of their default configuration. Um, because there's so many services, and I don't think it's as well explored as some of the, the other things out there. Um, yeah, I think there's still a couple that can still be found. Awesome, thank you for that. back what is up everyone it looks like we got nate on now what's up nate were you on earlier did you just join i believe he's setting up audio right now oh i'm a bit oh i'm a bit behind waiting to do the boot also just setting up my audio so i can't talk yet i should just keep talking to him <laughs> all right let's uh 
let's jump back into things. Share my screen, pull up our stuff here, and go over here, start my timer. And I'm excited to keep going. This is this is really, really interesting stuff. All right, start. Timer has started, Twitch is pulled up. Okay. So you found a nice server. Not all roles are created equal. I'm gonna scroll through here. This we can do to gain access to the edge node. This application is a very popular Hadoop application. Similar to Jupyter Notebooks, it allows data analysts to quickly write up scripts that can pull, process, and display analytics from the data stored in the cluster. It does this by making use of interpreters, which I was reading about in the documentation, I believe. Um, but where did I go? Of which there are many to choose from. However, not all interpreters are equal. Similarly, not all user roles are equal, right? And if I look at this, we have user one, user two, and user three, and we have these different roles here. So we might have to enumerate those users and see what, what they give us access to. So how does authentication work for this service? Could you perhaps do some lateral priv escalation to execute code? You will find the next flag in the home directory of the compromised OS user. The compromised OS user. What is the password of the user allowed to interface with the interpreters and provide a notebook? Well, let's find out. If we look over here, I bet it's I bet it's this this password thing right there. That's just gonna be a guess. <laughs> and if it is, it's user two. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that first. I'll cheat just a little bit. So just before you try that that password, um, which yeah. is the correct one, um, <laughs> just quickly try to actually run one of those um, notebooks on that test node, and you'll you'll also see that it points you in the right direction. So do you see oh, that little see. triangle to the right yep. hand side? So if you click to run it, you'll see that it's gonna tell you mm. uh, something's wrong, and then um, basically tells you that you don't have sufficient privileges for it. I see. Okay. So insufficient privileges are right note. Allowed users or roles is user two. And if we look back at our notes, we see it right there. And I just want to point out um, for those watching either on YouTube or now, that's just the importance of slowing down, right? And if you have documentation or stuff you have access to, like take the time to read through it. Even if you don't think it might be important, take the time to read through it and take screenshots of anything that might be useful. I had no idea if this would be useful or not. It just looked like it could come in handy. So there's my my lesson for, for all of us is take, take lots of notes. So if we do that, now let's go ahead and just log in as user two. That password should still be copied and let's log in. Now we don't need to save as password. So now if we go to test node and if we run it, it says pending. So you can see the difference there. We don't get the error and it runs through the notebook. Started a few seconds ago. We have an invalid syntax on the flag, but you know, it is what it is. What active interpreter can be used to execute code? Is it just Python? Yeah, so we can see that right there that we have Python running up there and Python right there. What OS user does the application run as? What OS, what OS user, os.system, cat, comp, flag, thm. Um, I don't, how do I go back to hide output? Nope, I don't know if that's what I wanna do. I don't wanna hide editor, show output. That's the error. Well, we can see it right here. What OS users does the application run as? Is it, I mean, it's a two, a two letter one. So you have RCE, right? So you should be oh. able just to use that to start um, running commands, just delete the flag part and then go happy typing your, your own notebooks there for remote code execution. Interesting. So with, with Python to run a command, it'd be os.system and I can just run, who am I, I suppose. Let's give that a shot. Uh, did I do it right? Oh, I need a print. 
What am I doing? Maybe it's print? That, that should no? work without print. I just think you hide your output. Just click that <laughs> That's right. I did hide my output. You're right. Yes. Let's, let's try it now. So if I do this, where would my, my blind? Let me scroll down. You're yeah. running two commands there, right? The first os.system command is just catting the entire shiro.ini file for you. So if you remove that, then you can just do your own commands. Thank you. ZP, look at that. <laughs> Glad you're here to help there. It took me a little bit to figure out what I'm doing. So we have remote code execution here. That is, that is cool. And it's in Python, and that's why it's importing OS, of course, so we can actually interact with the operating system. Yeah, that makes sense. What is the value of the flag found in the user's home directory? So if our user is ZP, we should be able to cat. It would be, well, we are ZP. So if we go to home and the user's home directory, I don't know if that'll work, but we'll try that first. I might have to enumerate around. No such. So let's go ahead and just LS. Let's figure out, or let's figure out our present working directory real quick. We'll do some. Enumeration. I suppose I could. I could technically get a shell. Maybe. We'll, we'll cat it this way, but home ZP Zeppelin flag two dot text. Nope. Let's try to get a shell. Because if we do like. We so obviously the shells have... you're gonna do in the in the next task, just use like an oh, okay. LS on that home CP directory so that you can actually see um, what the con uh, contents is. And you can also chain commands, right? So you can have LS and then in another one, sort of like LS, the home directory. Um, you don't just have to have one OS.system one there, you can have a lot of commands. Um, so my walkthrough oh, sure. of this, um, of this room, um, I basically hack the entire room through a Zeppelin notebook. Um, so everything is just a bunch of OS system commands for it. Um, but yes, you can do multiple sort of like operations um, to play around there. Ah, so it's in, if we do cat. And then just maybe a last piece of advice there, you can use um, Python prints to basically just separate the output. So before your first os.system command, you can literally write the line print, this is this cat, and then print, this is this cat, or, or Alice and everything like that, just to split your, your output neatly on the terminal. I see that, yep, here's the next command. So we have our flag there, and then here's the results of our next command of just ls home. Interesting stuff. Keeping tabs on all these keys. Finally, you have RCE. I didn't even realize I had RCE, but that I did. At this point, you should probably consider getting a stable shell, which is what my initial thought was, using your preferred method. While the entire challenge can be solved from a single notebook, this is just making your life more difficult than it honestly should be. Go get that stable shell before moving on. A bit of an added twist, but reverse shells will probably not do the trick in this lab. Huh. Since the Hadoop network does not have the relevant routes to communicate back on the VPN, this is often normal behavior in Hadoop networks for additional security, ensuring that the network can't communicate out itself. This may be the ideal time to test your bind shell skills. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and try to get that. So, I mean, there's probably a bunch of different ways we could do this. If we, I'm just going to for now delete that. If we do like which pipe whoops we know it has python so if we do which python there's our python python zero that's interesting so now if we do like just bind shell cheat sheet see if we can use python to possibly get a bind shell i think i saw it here just a note on that zero day that's to basically yeah. tell you that the notebook is finished. It's not actually part of the output. And that confused oh. me on the segment as well. Um, so it's usually good to like print a last line or something like that. Because the amount of times I thought the zero was part of the actual output that I was getting. <laughs> um, and going crazy because the user doesn't exist or the file doesn't exist or something like that. That zero can throw you off. 
That's helpful. Yeah, yeah, because I was like, I've never seen Python zero <laughs> before when I go which Python. So, Python reverse shell and bind shell. I like only do reverse shells. So let's let's try a bind shell. So we're gonna do Python C import blah blah blah. S bind, and that's probably gonna be our um, attacker IP there. Bin shell. Let's let's give this one a shot. We of course have to have a listener going. So we have our scan still doing here. We have is it done much? No. <laughs> might might take some time. Netcat NVLP switch user root. It doesn't really matter if you're root for this, but we'll make it consistent. And I think we'll just use the default that was in that script, which was four 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 four. So let's give that a shot and we'll just call this netcat. And if we go over to here and let's just go ahead and type paste in that command and we'll go user bin Python. I might work without doing that, but we'll do that for good measure. And let's go ahead and do our IP there of our, okay. This would be, would this be my normal try hack me IP or is this going to be different through, let's just do IF config. I'll answer just my own remember, question. Just remember, are you doing a reverse shell or a bind shell? <laughs> All right, let's look at the difference. I have it in my notebook actually. Let's see if I can answer my own question as well with my notebook. Like I only do reverse shells. So let's see. Some basics here. Reverse shell. Shell is access to a machine. Reverse shell means that a victim connects to our attack machine, right? That's like the only way I do this. We use them 95% of the time. Here's the 5% of the time we don't use it. Bind shell is opening a port on the target machine, and then we connect to it with our attacking machine. Syntax is the same, often used in an external assessment or when a reverse shell doesn't work. Okay, so our target, we're going to open this port. And then on our machine, we're going to connect back. I think I'm, I think I'm understanding this properly. So uh, we might have to figure out if Netcat is on the machine. Otherwise, we could use Python, I'd assume, for that. Let me... So same. that yeah. bind shell that you have there is a, um, is a Python bind shell already, right? So you don't need to worry about something like Netcat. But if you look at that S bind, right, what that's telling it is essentially with 0.0.0.0 is listen on all of my network ah, I got you for incoming connections. And then that Netcat listener that you started, you're just going to have to change that to a Netcat connection to actually connect to port 444 on and then the IP of the target machine that you're currently using. I see. Okay, cool stuff. Yep, I've never in all like if you look at all these boxes here, all reverse shells. <laughs> I haven't even used a bind shell on any of them. So this is this is good. This is good learning. So let's go ahead and open this back up. Go to our netcat listener. We'll just stop that for now. And so we have this. Let's just check our syntax. It all looks good to me. So it's opening port 444. So then with netcat, we will connect to port 444 and see what happens. So let's run. Invalid syntax. Okay, let's see where our invalid syntax is at. OS system file, blah, blah. So just right remember here. you're currently in OS.system, so you already have single quotes, right? So um, you might need to escape the quotes of the rest of the command of dash C, where it then goes import. So that first quote, you probably want to escape that and then that, um, and then the, the one that ends it as well for the dash C command that you're running. Or what you could have also done, but I won't recommend it, is you could just remove the entire user bin Python dash C part because you're already in a Python interpreter. You could have technically just sure. run the command import system and, and everything like that as well. Well, let's try that. Why don't you recommend that? Is it like a specific reason? 
because it fails a lot of the times. Um, so <laughs> just right. move it outside of the OS.system because it's actual Python commands as well. So um, it doesn't need to be in OS.system. You can literally just have it as Python code in the Python interpreter. And then I think you already are importing OS. So maybe just uh, remove that from your import list, the second one, or comment the first one out, whatever you prefer. Uh, I mean, let's, let's see. I've just yeah, had bad experiences <laughs> with that before. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, I still have an invalid syntax. Where's my invalid syntax at? Right here. Um, C dot. I just don't know enough about even doing this to know where the invalid syntax is. Let's. So if we. I think you have a extra um, bracket at the end of your command. So way at the end. I think that's an extra bracket. Did we try it? Hey, you're there right. You okay, let's see if that actually worked. So what we're gonna do then is with our netcat, we're instead just gonna do netcat and then the IP, which I don't remember which the IP was, is the 173 dot something dot something. It should say in our web browser. So we're connecting to this IP. If I can copy it, I'll have to take out that little thing, but netcat. Obviously not HTTP, we just want the IP here. And then I think we just space, oops, not like that. And then 44, okay, turn num lock on, 4444. Four, four, four. Look at that. We have a bind shell, isn't that interesting? So we could stabilize this just a little bit with uh, Python. Shell, reverse shell tools. This isn't a full stabilizer of it, but it might make it look just a little bit cleaner for us. Okay. Cool. You're back, awesome. Yep, it just took, it took us just a little bit. You are still left with the same problem. You can't access the data lake without Kerberos authentication. The question then becomes, if everything has to do with Kerberos authentication, how can this process be automated? If you have this many Hadoop services running and each of them has to authenticate itself before it can perform actions, there has to be an automated way of doing this. Ever heard of Kerberos key tabs? Never heard of it. Key tabs are magical things. Think of them as a Kerberos key. Essentially, you are storing all the information required, including the password to authenticate in a file. Key tabs can be generated by interfacing with the Kerberos server and executing the following command. So we have the key to pass slash pass. We have the password there, map user, the username slash out, next dot key tab, username, host name, P type, crypto, target, Okay, but wait, how is that secure? I can tell you how it's secure. That's really confusing, <laughs> simple. The security of key tabs relies on restricting access to the associated key tab file. So file permission should be used to protect the key tab file in question, similar to how SSH private keys are protected. However, by default, this key tab files do not inherit secure file permissions especially during the initialization phase, phase when the data lake is created and these keys have to be distributed to each node in the cluster. With this being said, go find the key tabs of the Hadoop services stored on this host. Use whatever enumeration techniques or scripts you would normally follow for privilege escalation after the initial compromise. Okay. So, start basic. Um, is it that, this, whoops. I don't think it's this password for the ZP user, but we'll find out. Nope. Okay, let's do our basic privilege escalation here. And, the way I do that 
is I use my notes here and there's usually a few different paths. First I try it the manual way and then if I can't get it manually, I'll eventually do like lin peas and see if we can find anything here. Here's we're gonna look to see if the sewage bit is set for anything. So maybe just to save a little bit of time as well, um, yeah. because this this room is meant to take you around sort of like four and five hours and everything like that, if you follow proper enumeration techniques, which which is yes. good for you to do here. You can execute things like linpies and all of that, but um, you're not going to find a privilege escalation from that perspective, except if you run kernel exploits. But I mean that's technically cheating on on any CTF, um, sure. unless it's 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 the method that you want to use that. Um, however, the thing should be pointing you now to, to key tabs, right? And the reason we provide the command to create a key tab is it tells you sort of like what a key tab file looks like. Um, you essentially have um, the file extension for a key tab. So key tab. maybe rather than following normal enumeration techniques, which would have pointed out these key tab files for you as well, um, it's good to do a little bit of a find on the host and look for any file that has that file extension and then take it from there. And then the last thing is also um, when you when you get stuck, you can also look at the questions. The questions are meant to guide you through that process as well on what you're trying to find. Sure. Okay, well, let's go ahead and I think I'm doing the syntax wrong for this. Actually, it's find it. I have it here somewhere. Um, if we go to enumeration, we're going to look for something like this. Find name flag, but we're going to change this to find key tabs. So let's give that a shot. Okay, that didn't work. Um, what was that? Just got our room pulled back up. So it's something key tab. Okay, that didn't work. So if you if you want a very horrific command, because I could never bother to learn the find syntax, right? <laughs> and people hate me for it. But you can run find space slash and pipe grep for whatever you're searching. Um, it's uh, uh, So just do the pipe character, then literally grep for whatever you're searching. It's horrific, but it works, it's magic. Um, so yeah, um, because that it gives awesome. you a lot of um, things. But um, yes, that's my, because I can't bother to learn the syntax thing. So here, here we found, I believe what we're looking for, I'm gonna grab a screenshot of this just because I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna complete this room tonight, so I'm gonna be coming back to it. I'll make sure I document all this stuff so I'm not repeating my work. Yep, I know, I'm the one who took the screenshot. So there are our key tabs, and let's go back to our find. I'm gonna actually grab that little find trick, because I always have to look up the syntax. So it was just find that grep and then file name basically that is great just remember if... your pipe command there because you need to oh, pipe yeah, whatever course. file you're finding which is literally every single file on the disk which is why people hate it um and then grip for whatever you're looking for if it works it works right it's a lot easier syntax all right let's jump back to this we have well, we have this what was the question it asked let's try to did you find them? Great, now let's use them. All right, they're all right here. Let's start small. Let's try to authenticate with Kerberos and the key tab associated with our user. The following guide provides excellent assistance on using key tabs for authentication. See how big this guide is. Okay, we'll keep it open as a tab. Oh, let's just glance through this actually. Create a key tab file, we don't need to do that. We have our key tab files here. Yarn, NM, right? Those are, root might be interesting. Those are the different services. ZP, a fun example, blah, blah. If the key tab, using key tab to authenticate scripts. So it's this kinet username at the domain. My key tab, my script. Replace username with your username. My key tab with the name of your key tab file. And my script with the name of your script. 
list the keys in a key tab file. List the content of a key tab file, use K list. So like, can I do that now? Yeah, interesting. So we can list the keys in the key tab and I'm gonna pause right here cause our break was about to go off. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Uh, once again, those of you on Discord, if you wanna chat, go ahead. I am gonna step away from my computer though, but I'll be back in five minutes. I'll be right back. I'm just gonna run to my office. I'll probably be back in 10 minutes. <clears throat> hey, I just got back. Um, tried talking. Uh, he said he'll be back. Uh, he had to run run to his office. 
Is it, it working now? Like 10. Yeah, I hear you now. Oh, sick. Nice. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, this is... That's the same one I used, but I just like took everything from quotes and just pasted that right in the in the notebook. Like I didn't use the OS.system context. Yeah. Wait, what did you take out? So everything up to Python dash C. Mm -hmm. So like OS.system, you're just dropping into bash and then Python dash C, you're dropping back into Python. So just take everything in that section of quotes and put it directly into the Python, uh, the Zeppelin notebook, I guess, because it's operating in the context of Python, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could show oh. what mine looks like, maybe. So I here's what here's saying. what he's talking about. If you look at my screen, it says import. You know, we don't have the OS system. Just right. import all of that, and then there's that extra parentheses on the end. At least it was for me. Oh, it looks okay. Like it is for you too. Because it is Python. Okay. Got it. All right, I am gonna start my timer back up real quick. We'll do maybe one more 25 minute session, at least I will. You guys are obviously welcome to hang around if you'd like, but 25 minutes. And we were learning about key tabs. I'm gonna jump over here. How is that secure? Simple, the security key, cat, key tabs Blah, blah, blah. Let's try to authenticate with Kerberos and the key tab associated with our user. We're interested in two commands, K-list. <clears throat> the K-list command can be used to gather information from a key tab, which I already did. I think that's what this was. Yeah, K-list. Since catting the key tab usually ends badly for your shell, we can use the following commands to output the principle stored in the key tab file, which I already tested here. K-init. The K-init command can be used to use a key tab, authenticate to the Kerberos server and request a ticket, we can use the following command. So first we have to get the principal and then we use K in it with the principal name, which I assume is this whole thing. My, mine's messed. Well, it kind of messes up the syntax there on me, but Authenticate and request a ticket, we can use the following command. While the dash V flag is not really needed, I highly recommend adding it for additional verbosity, such, such as actually knowing that you are authenticated. Without it, you won't see any useful output. Start by listing the principle stored in the services associate key tab, and then try to authenticate with the key tab. So that is that kp.service. So if we copy that path, and the command is klist, dash K like that. So it's that ZP slash Hadoop dot Docker dot com. So use the flag for revolts. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, what am I doing? Start by listing the principles stored and then try to authenticate with the key tab. So let's try that next. So if we do K in it, the principal name I think is this whole thing maybe? Or is it just Sadoop? I don't know, we'll find out. Sorry, I'm, I'm back again. Um, just before you run that command, just quickly ls-al.etc security key tabs directory. Just so you get a proper list of the key tabs and their associated oh, file sure. permissions. Because remember, file permissions is the thing that's keeping it secure. And we're going to um, do that a little bit later. Um, so there you go. Now you have those. And then, yes, you, you're on the right track for, for initializing with the ZP key. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Helpful. And mine, for those of you watching, maybe after the fact, you'll notice my format's always screwed up. And that's because I'm trying to give myself two monitors with my one small monitor. So it messes up a little bit, but let's go ahead and grab this. And then we'll follow the syntax that we have here. So first you have to do the K list and then you can get that information and now K in it. And then our principal name is going to be that right there. I believe dash K dash V for verbose to see if it actually connects dash T 
And then our key tab actual file, which is, uh, we navigated to the key tab folder. So we should just be able to specify this zp.service-keytab. Like that. So authenticated to Kerberos, it worked. Very interesting. I how have I, Nate? You ever heard of key tabs before? Never. Okay, me neither. And I've learned a lot of. Okay, and the other question, Nate, you ever use bind shells when you do stuff, or is it always a reverse shell? I don't know if you're talking or if you're ignoring me. Maybe your audio's still not working. I'm pretend like you said never to that too. Uh, delete a key. Oh wait, let's go back here. I'm looking at the docs for that. While well, the V flag, blah, blah, start by listing. We did that. Now that you are authenticated, we can finally start to interface with the data lake. However, you will soon notice that you don't have access to the CLI tools associated with Hadoop, the command line interface. The simple reason, the compromised user, which is ZP, um, does not have the correct environment pass set to use the Hadoop services. Go find the associated bin directory for the Hadoop services and either add this to your environment path or navigate to this directory to execute the associated Hadoop services. So what's all in here? Okay, a bunch of stuff. So we're looking for, go find for Hadoop services. Is it just called like Hadoop? Nope, nope, that'd be too easy. So this is where that other find trick can come in handy. If you run find and try to look for something like HDFS, um, which is one of the applications oh, we're going sure. to use, um, might point you in the right direction. And that comes directly from, um, just for those of you watching, if you remember when we were first learning about it, HDFS is that file type stuff. So I'm just gonna glance through here. Here's the interpreter stuff. I don't, so that's the Java files, obviously. Yarn, I wanna see it in bin. Yeah, just like a flood of text. Let's scroll. You just scrolled past it. Did there. I scroll past it? Shoot. Yeah, just go a little bit down and then you'll see there's a there's a user locale ah, installation. Ah. I think you need to go oh, way down. I'm like in the my other I'm in my other fine one right there. Okay, let's yeah, let's get that's that's why bearings. people hate running that fine command and everything like that. But um, if you, I'll, I'll help you here because this is not, not the, the interesting part. And I, I want us to at least get like one of the key tabs to get running. Um, but it yeah. should be under user locale. There it is. User locale Hadoop and then version 2.7.7. So if you quickly okay. navigate to that document first, then you'll see that we are in the Hadoop directory. And there is a lot of different versions of Hadoop and it's not like that a new version is necessarily better. Specific versions have specific applications that you can use. So a lot of the times it will be different versions that you have. So yes, there we go. Now you have the bin directory and you should be able to now use the actual commands. Okay, cool. So use whatever enumeration. Okay, let's, okay, let's, we're, we're way back here. Go find the bin directory. Found it. For starters, we're interested in interface with Data Lake's file list system. Thus, we will make use of the HDFS application. Right there. Have a read through the guide to get understand the type of commands you can execute. We'll glance at this guide real quick. Okay. Yep. We're definitely just going to glance at it. <laughs> User commands. 
we can so do maybe class. just to quickly help you with with yeah, this please. one because it's a it's a lot of documentation and again we had to read all of this to figure this out so like a fun if, you, if you want to do this in hard <laughs> mode you can definitely go for it but basically we are interested in one specific command right it's called hdfs and then space and then dfs which means you want to execute a distributed file system command so in your case it will be dot slash hdfs um because remember Oh, yeah, um, we are executing the application and then um, the, the other way around your 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 slash um, <laughs> so, and, and, and then uh, my delete is not working I think it's mine okay there we go cool um, and then it's essentially from that point you're executing file system commands right but it's it's weird because dfs and then like for example if we want to run ls that will now be dash ls and then space slash to list the root directory of the data lake so let's let's start there with a simple command so and then like a, a forward slash again because that's going to be the root directory and you can hit enter and you'll see that this will now authenticate you to the data lake using your kerberos key and you'll see we get a couple of nice warnings but you can see wow. we actually get the file system there but yeah. there's some nuances to those commands right so you don't have because we're going to use it you don't have a touch command um, for some weird reason it's not called dash touch it's called touch z for instance so there's those little bit of things that's just completely going to to throw you off but i mean you should be able to execute hdfs dfs and then for example dash pwd or dash cd if you want to cd to a different directory all of those different commands is essentially file system commands except that some of them are like one character off where it's not touch it's it's going to be touch z but i mean let's let's quickly you should be able to do a um let's let's get you all the way to to sort of like that first flag right so let's yeah. quickly go list the users and you know how to do that so that's just going to be your ls command and then it's going to be slash user to list those Okay. You'll see we get all of the different users and um, you do have some permissions, but of course you don't yet have root permissions. Um, also just a note on the distributed file system is it's exactly the same as a normal Unix file permissions. So all of the file permissions count for like normal users, for groups, and then for global. So in the user directories, right, you can probably access anything that the ZP user has access to. And then some of the things that the Hadoop services have access to because you're part of that group um, it's just important to to make a note here because this is what we're going to do for privilege escalation is your data lake user does not necessarily have to correspond with your file system user right and sure. I know that sounds weird, but because you're running through an application and that application is impersonating a user through a Kerberos key, that's where the, uh, the privilege escalation vector comes in. Because your data lake user is different from your file system user, let's say we're currently using the Zeppelin key tab and we're still going to use it for a little bit of time. But if we are able to use one of the other users key tabs and we can touch a file to the distributed file system, it's not going to be touched as our Zeppelin file system user, right? It's going to be touched as the actual distributed file system user. Now, that's great and all, but if we take it a step back to remote code execution, who are we executing as? No longer the file system user, but we're executing as the distributed file system user, whoever we impersonated in the Kerberos ticket. Which means sure. if you perform remote code execution, it no longer runs as your ZP Zeppelin user. It's going to run as whoever um, the user is in the key tab or the principle that you have in the key tab. And that's where the privilege escalation vector is going to come into play in a little bit of time. Um, but for now, just get your get your Zeppelin users on the distributed file system. You can now get flag number three. And then we will look for a different key tab to perform um, Kerberos authentication with. And then we're going to look to, to actually jump with it. But you have everything that you need now for, for the rest of this task. That's awesome. So we could we could just list, you know, user slash ZP. Let's see what files are there. 
and then cat the flag if it's there. Yeah, there it is. Cat user zp flag, oops, flag three dot text. Oh, I must have typed it wrong. Oh yeah, I did type it wrong. I really need to stabilize my shell so I can repeat commands, but um, cat user zp flag three dot text. Now we are talking about distributed storage. Gosh, it would have taken me so long to figure out. Maybe if I read through all that documentation, I'd eventually get it. How did you get to run that command? I can't even run the HDFS command. So you first have to navigate to the correct location, the bin, which is... Um, it you was, can run a PWD and it will, will give that proper one to, oh, to everyone that's oh, watching the video. That's smart. Um, it's not just root there. No, no, it's definitely that's not. That's what okay. threw it off. Gotcha. Because you have to go to the Hadoop thing because it's not in your environmental path. So you could add this to your path or you can navigate to this bin, but use your local Hadoop bin and then you can run that command. That makes sense. Okay. If it doesn't work, let us know. What directory stores the key tabs for the Hadoop services? Well, that was up there somewhere. <laughs> um, I think I took a picture of it actually. Yeah, Etsy security key tabs. I think that's what it's looking for. What is the key tab files name associated with the compromised user? That was the ZP. One zp dot service dot key tab. And you know what I should do as well. Well, I'm taking screenshots for when I come back to this later, so I don't have to repeat a bunch of work. I'm gonna grab this path as well, so I have it in my notes here. All right, jump back to here. What is the first principle stored in this key tab? I don't think I grabbed that, but that was the command I used way above. Let me just see if I can grab that. Blah, blah, blah. I, mean, I could probably just list it again. Oh, here it is. What is the full verbose command to authenticate with this key tab? I think it's right here. Oh, I typed it wrong or something. I think it's correct. Oh. Just check the hint. I think the flags need to be swapped, the dash V and the dash K. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I remember this problem. I, I still needed to fix it because I had a lot of users who, who just copied exactly what I gave them, which should be correct. Um, so just maybe swap the dash K and the dash V around should should work. Let's see. Um, maybe it's in no. T. So I got that one correct. But oh, I oh you, know what, you know what? You know what? Sorry, I, I just think that it's your your Etsy. You need to specify the full path to that key file. Sorry, I think I think that's actually the thing. So where you said zp service dot key tab, I just think um there it needs to be slash etc slash. Um, oh, I want the full path there, yeah. but I never sorry, get to it. That's why I didn't have to do that. That makes sense. Uh, let's see. Do I have this right? K dash p. Etsy key tab, Etsy security key tab. That's what I meant. It's an Etsy security key tab. There we go. There we go. Okay. We can move on to task six. Anyone else following along? If you're stuck, feel free to speak up. Got to run. Super interesting box. All right. Peace out, JRAM. Looks like JRAM finished this port scan. I'm going to say teamwork makes the dream work and copy that image and throw it over to my notes. Then I can, when I work on this later, I'll have that. 
instance, what I'll do is enumerate some of these interesting ones. We'll just dash P and specify those ports when we get back to that point. You know, this box should be like thousands of points. <laughs> I can't imagine doing this uh, without help. Yeah, it, it it was a it was a big one, um, and uh, again, like it's three weeks worth of like research and everything boiled down into a single room. It's it's not meant to to go fast, but but you're almost there. Like once you get sort of in the next task, you're going to get the hang of remote code execution on the data lake. Sure, and then it's just about sort of like repeating the steps, and um, then you get to the end. Well, let's keep going. Even though we now have access to the data lake, we still have not performed privilege escalation. We, we will need to do something in order to gain full control of the cluster. And that's where we're going to talk about probably that impersonating stuff, grabbing other uh, key tabs, I'm assuming. We still need... Come on. Stay. We still... Blah, blah. After authenticating to the data lake, things start to get interesting. You see, even though the data lake may look like a normal Unix file system, in terms of authentication and access control, things work a tad bit different when it comes to Hadoop. One key concept to understand is that your current OS user and your cluster user does not have to correspond. And that's what you were explaining through a Kerberos, the cluster will believe you are whoever you authenticate as regardless of your actual OS user. Let's verify this concept before starting an exploitation path. Use the touch Z option of the HDF interface. To touch a file to the temp directory. Oh, leave me alone. Let's go like that. And then use LS option to list the contents. Here it is there. Interesting. This is the contents and review the permissions associated with that file. Read, write, no, execute, read, read, zp root. Huh. So what if we impersonate another Hadoop service? Often the services in Hadoop has to often the services in Hadoop have to perform impersonation to allow them to perform their duties, which makes sense. The Hue user may have to impersonate the HDFS user to create a new home directory. The Zeppelin user may have to impersonate the Yarn user to schedule a job. Yarn may impersonate the node manager to allocate processes to different nodes. The secure way of configuring this is to copy key tabs and restrict them down with granular file permissions to only the services that require them. But ain't nobody got time for that. So what organizations usually do is they just... CH mod the hell out of these keys until the services can impersonate as they deem fit. In our case, our organization at least tried to perform some key segregation by using group permissions, but it is honestly not that much more secure. Based on your enumeration results, you should see that our compromised user has access to a number of key tabs from other services due to being a member of the Hadoop services group. Which, if we... About. Now the question becomes, which of these users can lead to privilege escalation? Have a look through the group memberships to find the service that sometimes has to act like a normal service, whereas other times it has to invoke its super abilities to perform tasks. This will be our target. Have a look through the group memberships. So if we do to go like this, I'm confused on what I'm doing now. I think it's, I've been sitting in front of my computer too long. I already did this once. Um, okay, maybe LS quickly user. copy copy out that um, Etsy um, security key tabs. Copy that out to, to OneNote so we can just look at that output properly. Um, and then we'll discuss a potential um, privilege escalation path. And then when you get back from break, we can, um, we can get sorted on actually sort of like doing a privilege escalation test with DFS. And then the big one where we actually go for remote code execution. Um, I think it's key tabs. Um, yeah. Oh. So let's let's quickly get that output and let's let's discuss it. And then after the break, um, we can. Oh, just do a LSS. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I got it. I confused the two the entire. Okay. So with that one there, 
All right. So we are currently the Zeppelin user. And what should be interesting here as well, so copy that one, and then we're gonna copy two other things as well. So sure. then just quickly go do a cat etc password so that we can get the operating system users and then cat etc groups. And then you can just copy that last part. That's the only part that's important where it's like DNN, um, JHS, yeah. node manager, all of the dupe type Got of it. things, other things that we're interested in. And then cat etc groups so that we can also just figure out those groups. And then we'll quickly have a discussion and then take a break and then we'll get you remote code execution. Um, oh, cat etc group, sorry. Um, yeah, there we go. So I there see. where it's the dupe stuff. Yeah. So normally what happens when you use something like a Bari manager to create these different things, mm -hmm. it will only create those two groups for you. So you have a dupe services and then you have a dupe super services and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, now you should technically be splitting the permissions quite a bit more, um, but that's sort of like default configuration that's happening here. So you have the dupe services, which is just your normal services that is servicing essentially um, the data. Like, so you have DN, you have Zeppelin, JHS, no name node, you have RM, Spengo, and, and Yarn. Um, but okay. then you also have super services, and your two super services is essentially node manager because it literally needs to manage every single node in your data lake. And then sure. interestingly, Yarn again, because Yarn is going to do job allocation right so see, it needs the ability to to locate um and then sort of like tell a node to perform a specific job so sometimes it's doing things from the normal service perspective and sometimes it's doing things from the super perspective so what's interesting here now is if we start to piece these things together we can see that yarn is the user that is going to allow us to do lateral movement from the hadoop services group to the Hadoop supergroup, right? Um, and the yep. reason that's important is if we have a look, then we can see that Yarn's key tab can be read by the Hadoop services group, which our Zeppelin user is part of. But then where it gets interesting is we want to essentially take over node manager because if we take over node manager, we control the entire data lake. And node manager's key tab is only readable by either root or the Hadoop super group. And since Yarn is part of that group, we essentially want to do a privilege escalation to Yarn, which is going to allow us to read node manager's key tab. And that's then gonna allow ah. us to essentially compromise the entire data lake. Um, so that's gonna be the path that's going to be followed. I think you'll probably for, for tonight, you'll get to the point where you execute remote code execution as Yarn, but then it's just repeat the steps, right? Once you're Yarn, you can just impersonate node manager and you can repeat the steps again. And then it becomes normal privilege escalation. But once you compromise node manager, it, it gets a little bit sad, um, honestly, because at that point, yeah, you, you'll see. But at that point, um, the privilege escalation doesn't, it's, it's not even fun anymore because it's, it's so simple. And that's unfortunately how it really is in, in the real world. So we'll, we'll at least get you remote code execution and get you to the Yarn user um, before the end of tonight. Okay, that is fascinating. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep moving. It's almost midnight here, but we'll stay in a little bit later. At least I will, I don't know if, who else is on Discord. Nate might as well, we'll see. But we'll see how far we get. We're, I'm just gonna keep moving. Let's, uh, that's fascinating. I just can't believe I've never even like heard of this before. Uh, this is cool stuff. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Let's go like this. Nope, that's not what I meant to do either. It's always like after I've been on for a few hours and it gets late at night, my brain's just fuzzy. So <laughs> bear with me here. All right. Glance through some of this, have a look. Uh, HDFS impersonation is cool and all. We can access the home directories, but from an OS perspective, we are still blah, blah. So we're going to redo what we did a little bit, but we're going to grab yarn. We have this Hadoop attack library. I'm just going to glance at this as well. We'll keep that pulled up. Ah, oh, fascinating. We're going to use that for, for remote code execution. So um, 
I, I think you might have missed your your break timer if you if you wanted a break. Um, no, but I'm gonna skip it. We... We're good. Okay, cool. So let's then quickly impersonate the yarn user next, right? So that's potentially going to be our attack path. Um, and as we know that we um, have access to the yarn users key tab because we're part of the Hadoop services. Um, uh, group. So let's quickly first do the klist command so that we can just get the Kerberos principles for the yarn user. So that's your kinit command. So keep that one. So we'll do klist and then just first. Yeah, it's klist dash k, and then it's going to be Etsy security key tab, and then yarn dot service dot key tab. So we can just confirm um, the principles. And I think yes, that should be good. Let's see if it works. Let me see. Otherwise, it might have to be, oh, key tabs, sorry. Oh, yeah, um, key tabs. Yep, you're good. I need to go check that because then it shouldn't yeah, I accept think that, that one as was wrong. Mm. Yep. Okay. Now, Nate also told me there was something weird with that flag submission. I'll check it out afterwards. Okay, so there you have the Kerberos principle. So you can now copy that. And we can now get a K init command and then you're going to start to see some magic on the distributed file system, which is, this is where sort of like my mind got blown um, when I I'm sure when you're doing this, this for an actual assessment. Yes, yes. Um, where you start to realize like there's such a discrepancy between the user you're actually on the data lake versus on the file and file system. So we'll initialize with this K in it. Perfect. Okay, now go do a touch Z command again to the temp directory. Um, and then you're going to start to see a DFS and then dash DFS. touch Z. And uh, uh, I think it's without a dash for that first one for DSS. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. DFS, Oops. sorry, DFS, Gosh. distributed file system. It's late for you, it's touch. still early for me. So. Yeah. <clears throat> touch Z. Splash slash temp and then give it a second pass like test two or, or something and let's let's see what we get there okay seems to be working and then if we run an alice on that file and this is where it really starts to to ramp up in terms of it so we're still zeppelin but if you look at test yeah. two that belongs to the yarn user so according to to like all intents and purposes for Gosh. for Hadoop, we are Yarn. We're no longer Zeppelin, right? Yeah. But just having access to files is not going to cut it, right? We want remote code execution so that we can become a better user, essentially the the Yarn user. So in this case, let's quickly go to that attack library, um, and you can full screen that one, and then I'll show you some of the commands. It took ages to figure out syntax. So we're going to skip everything in terms of the practical hands-on and go straight to number five, which is execute remote commands, because that's really all we, we care about tonight. Um, and you'll see that there's a bunch of different things. And there's basically two type of things that you can do. You can either execute a single command. And what we do there is we basically are going to now use the Hadoop application. So dot slash Hadoop instead of HDFS. Um, sure. And then we are going to execute a jar file. So Hadoop has a bunch of Java applications which are stored in jar files. And the one that we are really interested in is the Hadoop streaming jar, which is essentially streaming a MapReduce job. And then there's a bunch of things we give it. We give it input, output, and we configure a reducer. And then with Mapper, we can essentially run a single command. Some very, very important notes here. So the first yeah. thing is dash input is a non-empty file on the data lake. So that's why we exercise the touch Z command. And don't ask me why touch Z creates a non-empty <laughs> file. I would think there have to be something in it, but it's not. As long as the file is there, it says it's non-empty, but essentially a non-empty file on the data lake. So that's why we touch those to the temp directory. We're going to specify those. Then output is a non-existent. So something that doesn't exist yet 
in the directory on the HDFS. So again, it's good to write that to our user directory. So we'll specify something like slash user slash yarn when we execute the command um, and then like directory one or test one. Um, and then what's very important that every single command you execute, remember it then creates that directory. So the next time you run it, it needs to be test two and then test three and then test four um, because the directory is no longer non-existent. And then mapper is where we'll do our single command, but very important there is Hadoop has no environment paths configured, right? So that's mm -hmm. why when you want to run cat, you can't just run cat etc password. You need to run slash bin slash cat and the etc password um, directory there. Um, and then that's basically also going to write the output to our output directory. And then because we are not actually writing a proper Hadoop command, we can't do reducer. We can't reduce the job into smaller chunks. So we just configure the reducer to, to say none in, in this specific case. So that's if we want to execute a single command, right? And if you scroll sure. a little bit down, you're going to see if we wanted to do something like a meterpreter mm -hmm. shell, which um, is a little bit more interesting. And you'll see that it's exactly the same command with a dupe jar and then sort of the streaming jar that we're going to use there. We have an input, which again is a non-empty one. We have an output, but this time for mapper, we are essentially giving it a executable. So something like meterpreter.elf is something that we can put there. I'm a big fan of doing like an sh file. And then essentially what's nice about that is you can add the shebang to your file, which means that at that point, things like environment paths get, get loaded in. So if you do like a shebang for bin sh, then you have all of the environment Path, so you can just run copy or cat or anything like that. And then we're not going to reduce it again. And then this is where it gets interesting. You then give it the file on your local environment. And what's going to happen is that Hadoop is going to copy that local executable to the data lake, and then it's going to execute it for you. So this is where it gets a little bit more interesting with the file. So maybe what you can do is copy that wow. entire example command. And then we are going to configure it in Notepad to look a little bit better for, for ourselves. So sure. first things first, we are going to run dot .slash. So let's do dot .slash Hadoop is the first thing we want to fix um, at the start. Okay, then we are not, we do not have version 2.7.3, right? So you see Hadoop yep. streaming 2.7.3. We have version 2.7.7, .7, so we need to fix that. And then it's also wise, since you can install Hadoop in a bunch of different locations, let's just specify the full path for that streaming jar. So that will be user, locale, Hadoop, and then slash here, slash Hadoop, slash tools again. So just so that we know, uh, wait, the first user, then um, slash user, then slash locale, and then slash um, Hadoop. That should be our path. Uh, again, Hadoop. It's it's two Hadoops. So oh. it's slash Hadoop slash. Uh, yes, I'll I'll show yeah, you on the I file gotcha. system that that's the actual the actual one there. Okay. So that's the next thing that we want to to fix there. Then for input, let's make that um, let's make that slash temp slash test. Um, or yeah, let's make that test.txt, but make it test free because I think we already have a test and a test yep, two. We so we're just keeping that. And then the output, let's output, um, I don't, yes, you will have permission in the temp directory. So output to slash temp slash, and then let's do temp one, for instance, for, for that type of thing. Okay, perfect. So that's going to be our output directory. And then the mapper, let's run um, path on the HDFS. So why don't we just run something like shell dot, um, shell one dot sh. Let's do that. We'll create that file for ourselves. And then the file, in our case, um, we need to create that on the local file system. So let's do that in the file system temp directory. So let's make that slash temp slash shell one dot sh. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So let's Jeez, go. 
that's a, a lot of syntax. So first things first, we need to create that testfree.txt. So that's just going to be a simple HDFS touch command that we're quickly going to run to create that one. Touch Z tap test three dot text like that, I think. Perfect. Yep. Yes, that should be good. Okay, so now we have that one. Now um, let's go create a shell file for ourselves in the temp directory. You, you can, if you want to go for MSF Venom, you're welcome. I sure. use sort of like the, the local stuff just because it, it's a little bit easier to, to do. Um, so let's quickly, so the first thing we need to do is we're going to set up a, let's, let's type out our shell and then what we'll do is we'll actually create it because we're going to have to use a bunch of echo commands because I'm pretty sure with a non-interactive shell we can't use something like vim or nano. So the first thing we want is we want the shebang, right? So that is going to be um, hash and then it's going to be exclamation mark and then bin uh, slash bin slash sh right um or you can do bash if you if you want to okay so we have that then what's probably good is what shall we use the python bind shell again is probably going to be good so if you go yeah. to your zeppelin notebook you can just copy that bind shell oh yeah good point and then we're just gonna make the port one more so Oh, but you know what? Uh, yeah, copy, copy that command. We're gonna, we're gonna fix yeah. it. We just need to wrap that around a Python dash C command. So there we go. So then just Python dash C import and then put a final one. I think that should be good. Yes, and then just, so just add that port, to. Right? Uh, yes, so just change the port to 4445 and then just hit enter because you want that to be on the next line. Um, you don't want it to be, uh, no, um, between bin sh and python because otherwise it's going to see that as oh, part yeah, of your sure. shebang. Yep, gotcha. Okay, cool. I think that is probably, oh, just for, for interest sake, for our own sanity, right? Because, I mean, we're going to run this thing in background, so we don't actually know if it works. So let's, for interest sake, to keep ourselves safe, let's write another command before the Python one. So let's quickly do a copy command. So after the shebang, but before the Python command, let's do a copy of Etsy security key tabs and let's copy node manager's key tab to, um, to um, the temp directory. So node manager .service .key tab, and then space, and then let's copy it to slash temp, and then you can hit enter, and let's then also just change the permissions of that thing. So let's do chmod777 on slash temp slash node manager .service .key tab, because if all else fails, we at least have the node manager uses key tab um, so that we can impersonate him now um, with, with K in it as the Zeppelin user. And the chmod is just because Zeppelin user doesn't have those permissions. So if we chmod that thing, it means anyone can, can at least read it. So sure. that should be everything we need. Now we need to get that into an actual shell file. So yeah. that should be echo in front and then um, a dash. Yeah, let's let's go create that shell file and get that thing working yep. on shell sh. And we're going to save it to, where did we say? Temp, oh, right up here. Temp shell one sh. So let's just navigate to that maybe. No, can't really do that. Because we'd have to do hdfs dfs echo like that am i doing this right um no 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 so so we're not going to execute hdfs commands right this is we we just need to create it on the local file gotcha. system um so um, yeah so so basically just echo and then uh, shebang so so that's going to be our um yes that one just that one. check is Echo, okay, yeah, and then just a single um, single greater than sign, and then slash temp slash show one dot sh, and hit enter. Cool. 
What? Is that maybe a special character? Do it without quotes. It should be. Oh, do it without quotes? Oh, Got yeah. It. Yep. Shebang. Bin. Shell. Tap shell 1.sh. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Then the sense. next one, yeah, just make sure that it's actually there. Be there. Is there something? I don't think so. Why did ours Crazy. not create it? Um, that should work. Yeah. Otherwise, we're gonna do this Python style. Okay, go to, um, yes, this is weird. That should be working. Give me a second. Did it work for you, Nate, when you did it? Yeah, it's working for me. Um, well, actually, you know what? I am like, <laughs> it's, it's getting late for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off and I'm gonna try to continue this. Before I jump off though, any, any closing notes, any closing words of wisdom you'd have for us, Amoeba man? as I work my way through this, when I no, come back I mean, on. No, I think at this point you're, you're sorted with it. So basically yeah. the, the next trick is, is, to do, um, is to do remote code execution through that Hadoop thing. And then at that point, it's going to be to have to repeat the steps for, for the next service. Um, so now that we can do this for Yarn, the next steps is going to be that we want to do it for, um, for Node Manager. And then technically from the node manager user, because that is the super, super user that control all nodes, at that point, it should be a privilege escalation vector that we're gonna follow. But like I mentioned, it's gonna be a very sad one. Um, that's gonna allow you to basically um, compromise the full host. And now since you compromised a single node in the data lake, it gets even sadder essentially how you compromise all of them. Um, sure. So that should allow you to compromise that second note. But if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask me once you, you get time again. 12 o'clock hacking, um, sometimes I know there's a lot of commands that go wrong. Yeah. So, no, it's, uh, yeah, I've been going since well, two hours now, but it's been good. This has been like, man, I've learned so much in the past two hours. It's just, it, it's way different than any other try hack me box I've done or hack the box. And almost seems more realistic. I mean, you said you got it from a legit security assessment. It's not as CTFE, you know, as some of the other machines, where it's the standard like get a reverse shell, then check where the sewage bit set, then go to GTFO bins, and then elevate your privileges. Right? This is this is good. This is really interesting. Any Glad words you, you got, yes. Nate? What are your thoughts on it, Nate? As you've been going through it? Um, it's yeah just like you said it's it's more realistic i like that um i've always been kind of interested in like the clustered computing and never really got to to play with it so it's really cool to see um what is this hadoop yeah yeah cool to learn about hadoop and, and see it in action and then also be hacking it first time being exposed to it so good stuff well for those of you watching on twitch or youtube i'm gonna sign off with you guys Thank you for joining. What day is it today? I don't even know what day it is. Thursday? No, it's not Thursday. Well, it's kind of Thursday. It's past midnight. So I'll be back on tomorrow. And uh, I'll try to keep working our way through this tomorrow evening and see if we can knock this room out. So here's part one. And part two will happen tomorrow, hopefully. So I will see some of y'all then if you're back online. Otherwise, we'll see if we can stumble our way through this. You guys all have a good night.